You're listening to Real Folk with me, Jo Burke. Hello, one and all, and welcome to Real Folk with me, Jo Burke. And my wonderful, wonderful guest today is the absolutely delightful Lynn Ruth Miller. Hello, sweetheart. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Now, uh, Lynn Ruth, if you haven't heard of her, you should have. She is an amazing, amazing person. She's a comedian. Are you the oldest comedian in the world? Or I think so. I think I'm the oldest stand-up. Anyone older than I can't stand up. <laughs> so you're definitely... No, I really, I really think that's true. Right, excellent. I, I have not... I found one that I saw that's somewhere like in China or something that's 85. I'm going to be 87 in six weeks. So you top that person anyway? Yes, yes. Fab, fabulous. And amazingly, uh, Lynn Ruth, didn't you didn't start comedy until the age of 70. So um, really, I think it would be uh, lovely for the listeners to um, find out about why you suddenly decided to do a turn into, uh, into doing a turn. Well, what happened is I'm trained as a journalist. I am trained as a, as a journalist. And I've always been looking for the big story because I like to say it's because of ageism and sexism, but it could be because I'm a lousy journalist. But whatever it is, I never got a job in a magazine or a newspaper. And I tried for years. I tried from the time I was 31 uh, when I graduated from Stanford. And I could never, I could get freelance articles, but I could never get a job. And I was surfing the net for jokes uh, that I used to promote one of my books. Uh, it's called Thoughts While Walking the Dog. And I was looking for, and I saw this thing that said San Francisco Comedy College. And I thought, this is a scam. You can't teach someone to be funny. They have to have that sense of the ridiculous. You really can't teach them to be funny. This guy is ripping off young people. I finally found my story. It's taken me 40 years, but I finally found my story. So I called the guy up and I said, and his name was Curtis Matthews. And I said, I would like to write a story about you in two, two magazines and one newspaper because I was doing freelance work for uh, the Pacifica Tribune and Stanford Magazine and uh, Coast Views. And he said, he called me back in five, we left messages in those days. <laughs> this, was, this was 2003, we left messages. And he called back and he said, I just love small Jewish women. <laughs> and of course, yeah, right. And I'm four foot 10. So I said, uh, you have arrived. But when I, I did not know at that time that stand-up comedy was a profession. I, had, I have not had a television set since 1980. So the only stand-up comedy I saw was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And I had no idea that people were actually doing this to train to make money. Yeah. And when I walked in, and uh, Curtis Matthews now calls me his poster child, because, of course, I've been a bigger success than anybody else that's been there. Um, in comedy, uh, Ross, uh, what's his name? Ross Taylor, I think. Uh, he's big in acting now. But I don't think any of them that took his course uh, did what I've done. I bet they haven't. Because I've, I've gone on, yeah. Um, because everybody in my class has not, they don't do it anymore. No. But also, how old, least, how old were the people in your class? Oh, about... 19, 20, <laughs> 21. I was old enough to be their great grandmother. And how was um, that? But I, I loved it. Fabulous. I'm having trouble now where I live, where you can't move into the place unless you're 65. Uh, the people here are too old for me. <laughs> they, they don't have the energy and they don't have the interest. And the excitement about life. I mean, there's a wonderful saying, uh, kids, they always say children say the most wonderful things. And this one little girl, she was four, and she said to her mother, oh, I just love this life. Well, I do too. And the people in this building oh. don't. <laughs> so they've given up already. They really don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's what, what do you call it? God's waiting room. I, it's, uh, no, 
I'm so excited with my life. I mean, I've got this new book coming out. What is it called? Getting the Last Laugh. Getting the Last Laugh. And I'm on the cover holding a little Irish Jack, uh, Jack Russell. Uh. And you can tell the dog is Irish because he has a glint in his eye. <laughs> but anyway, so I took the course, never dreaming uh, that I would ever be on stage. I'm an educator and I'm a journalist. But, you know, you take the class and they teach you about microphones and they teach you about set up punch and they teach you all this stuff. Uh, and he said to me when I walked in, he said, I can't teach you anything. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, you can, Curtis. I haven't had sex in 40 <laughs> years. But he um, uh, <laughs> he uh, did teach me. Uh, he did teach me a mic technique and he did teach me what stand up comedy was. Right. Which I had no idea. So. When you take the second class, which I did, and in that one, I think half the first class dropped out. Right. I'm now graduating to second class. You did uh, an open mic at Cobb's Comedy Club in San Francisco, the city. Right. And uh, and I love the city. I love it. Um, but anyway, um, I took. I went up. I when I got on stage, I don't know whether this has happened to any uh, anybody listening. But suddenly, you know, you're in the right place doing the right thing. I have to say, I got the same effect when I was lecturing as a professor. I was doing what I needed to do. And I remember lecturing and I remember being terrified. My God, 500 people are sitting and listening to me. And I thought, ah, but once I started, I was in the zone. That happened to me when I was 33. Now I am now 70. By that time, I'm 71 because I took two classes. Um, I got up on, on uh, Cobb's comedy stage and I was there. And because I've been writing comedy columns for years, I know how to write a joke. And because I'm Jewish, I know how to tell a joke. So I was the only, I was not that good. I don't want anyone to think, oh my God, she just was wonderful. No, I wasn't. But the others were so bad. <laughs> And people came up to me after, and I had lived, it's very interesting to know, I had, I had been sick, and you know about this, from the age of 36 to 47, I was in essence an invalid. I wasn't confined to my home, yeah. but I had no life. Uh, I was painting pictures and writing stories and walking a dog, which is why, by the way, the lockdown has not been a problem for me. Can we just share what, what you, uh, so it was anorexia and... Uh... And bulimia. But no, that was not, it was the result. And I want everybody that goes to those websites, which I would like to blast, that, that for anorexics that say, don't give up. I suffered what my, I had conquered the main uh, uh, symptoms of anorexia, not the psychological symptoms, but the physical symptoms by the time I graduated from Stanford, which was in my early 30s. But my body was still suffering from the fact that I starved myself and then stuffed myself from the age of 17. I'm going to say 17, but it might have been 16. Definitely from 17 um, on to uh, during the marriage until I was about 20, 29. So I, and I suffered what that did to my body is what I am suffering today. What started that off was um, in, in your childhood, was it your, it was your relationship with your mom? Definitely my relationship with my mother. And I have, I used to say, no, it was many other things. But now that I've written this book and I've done my cabarets and I've sorted it out, I really get that my mother I was my mother's scapegoat. And in the 30s and the 40s, you don't have the, the groups that you can go to or the teacher you can tell. Um, I had just uh, a couple months ago, uh, my friend, and I don't want to say her name because she was reported by her child for abuse. And what she had done is the kid was brushing her teeth and they have invested a lot into her teeth. 
and my friend didn't think she was brushing her teeth right and she lost it. I cannot imagine this. She threw something at the kid and the kid reported her to, the, uh, to her teacher. I had similar abuse, never physical, never physical, but I had similar abuse from the time I was, oh, from the time I was eight until uh, she finally died. <laughs> and it was unremitting reminders of my failure, unremitting. She would, if she was in a bad mood and she wanted to feel good, she'd call me up and tell me what a mess I was. And I, I bought into it, I believed it, I believed it. But the point is, I had a modeling teacher, because remember I was a mess. So I had a modeling teacher that taught me to, to walk with a book on my head and high heels. And her name was Helen McHenry. And I used to cry to her and tell her these terrible things that my mother would do. And I couldn't, I'm never physical. My mother never raised a hand to me. Uh, but her voice is, was so bad that if anyone now, Joe, if anyone raises their voice to me, believe it or not, this is terrible because I'm a logical person. I'm done with them. They never get a second chance. I'm done. And it could be just that they're having a bad day and I said the wrong thing at the wrong time. I'm done. Yeah. I lived with it until I was 50 no and I'm no done. More. Yeah. And, and, and that is not logical and it is not right. No. I'm having an episode now with someone where this guy doesn't understand why I'm angry at him. He raised his voice to me. I will not have that again. I will not be exposed to it. And it's because I was bludgeoned for so long. But in any case, now that I'm out of it, now 80, I'm 86, I'm almost 87, I look back and I realize I was her kicking post. She was actually a lovely person. And I mean, it, you know, I'm going to say, no, she wasn't. Yes, she was. But she was deeply unhappy. Be very unhappy, but she was very much like me, sweetheart. All the things that you love in me, my mother was. My mother was the one with a sense of humor. My mother was the one with immense compassion for anybody but me. Immense compassion. Interesting. Uh, my mother loved animals, and you know how I love animals. She loved to look pretty and be pretty. And, and I love clothes and I love dressing, which is why when I look in the mirror, I want to kill myself <laughs> uh, because uh, everything has dropped. When I want to see my face in the mirror, I have to jump up because it's all down by my waistline. So that's what happened. And then getting back to when I was on that stage, I didn't know you made money at it. I didn't know it was a career. I knew I had to do it again. 70 years old never connected with people. I had a TV program where I interviewed people, right. but I never had the kind of relationship like we have, where I talked to them and knew about them. It's a conversation, isn't it? Comedy is a conversation. Yeah, but but yeah. I knew, and cared about them as human yeah. beings. I had no friends. Um, I had interview friends, yeah. you know, but nobody I called and said, you know, I'm feeling really crappy. Nobody like that. Right. I had... I had a friend, she was absolutely wonderful. Her name was Elaine Larson, uh, who was the assistant editor of the Pacifica Tribune, that if I was sick or if I needed something or had to go shopping and couldn't carry something, I would call Elaine. I had that kind of a friend, but I didn't have a friend like you and I are. I didn't have that. Now I have really a lot of them, but I didn't have that. So there I am suddenly in heaven, most people, when they do their first five minutes, they want to kill themselves. Not me. I loved it. I thought, oh, they're laughing at me. They love me. And the age barrier disappeared. And what I did is I started asking to go to open mics. And that's when I first met ageism. They didn't want me, even if I was doing it for nothing. Right. If they were booking, they didn't want me. And then a man named Tony Sparks and I want everyone to know about Tony Sparks because Tony Sparks, though he doesn't realize it, has been a victim of racism. He's black. He should be on every TV program you've ever seen. He should be nationally immense. But he comes from Arkansas and he's had to fight for one of the things, he's had to fight for everything he's gotten. And when he fights, he doesn't have the legal support that you would have. Right. He doesn't have it. Nobody helps him. So what he is, is in San Francisco, Tony Sparks is the reason any of us got anywhere with our comedy. So is he a promoter or an agent or a... No, 
he ran an open mic that was open to everyone without prejudice and it was without discrimination yeah. and it was called the brainwash <laughs> and it's closed now he does another one but it's not as good as the brainwash the brainwash was a laundromat you went there to do your clothes and then you went in the other room to listen to a bunch of Amazing. terrible comedians <laughs> oh it was great you you didn't get paid i always got a free drink but tony came to one of my shows at 50 mason which was booked by a woman named Susan Alexander, whom I also owe a great deal to. She booked me. She didn't care about my age. She booked me. And she she gave us a green room. And I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I was shocked. And st I thought you sat in the audience and got up and did it. And here we are at a place with drinks and, and snacks. Nice. And what? <laughs> yeah. And, but, but Tony came to 50 Mason with another comedian. And he came up afterwards and he said, you are amazing and you are funny. And I believe I have that. I'm sure I have it in the book. And he sat with me and helped me create a set. The interesting thing is Tony is an MC, and MCing in America is different from here, but it's an art. When I booked Tony to do a set, he couldn't do it. It's a different skill, isn't it? It's a different skill altogether. And you could you can be I mean, some people do both excellently, but you can be an amazing comedian and not the greatest compare, or you can just be an amazing host and compare and not cut it as a, as a sort of 20 minute or an hour long type comedian. So just going back to, um, so you started there in San Francisco and I was going to the Edinburgh Festival. That's the connection. Yeah. And I think that's where we first met. I've been going to the Edinburgh Festival since 1988. And occasionally I would come into London, but after I think five years, I started also going to the Brighton Festival. Yeah. And the thing that is amazing, and I don't have it in the book because I didn't want to cry poverty, is I was living on next to nothing. I, when I, after I paid my mortgage on my house, which talks about how I bought it in the, in the, in the book, after, and which was a miracle, I had maybe disposable income, maybe about a hundred dollars, not even that much. Oh, less than that, 50. And on that, I drove a car and fed myself. That was it. I never bought any new clothes. I no, I never went to a movie, right. nothing. And and now during all this time, I never went anywhere except to do my TV program and to do my interviews. I was paid almost nothing for these articles. I think. $35, I think, which is about 20 pounds. I paid, I was paid to do a weekly column and to do features that took hours and hours to do. But so, all right, so no social life whatsoever because of the anorexia and because I needed to control how I ate. So I didn't go into a bulimic binge, never a restaurant. Right. And then I started comedy. You meet people for lunch. You go out for <laughs> dinner so after. Yeah, yeah. You dress. Yeah. I'm running around in track suits. You dress. What do I do? I got the woman across the way who was a seventh day at Venice, <laughs> very, very religious, for pennies. She made me clothes. Um, she made me clothes to wear. Uh, I'm meeting people. I'm going to a restaurant and I'm not dying because of anorexia you have every kind of rule yeah all right i'm going out for the first time in my life i'm having fun and the people i'm having fun remember i didn't have a partner either i haven't had a partner since i was 25. i was just going to say let's go back to that because you had a you 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 obviously went from having not the happiest of childhoods oh to terrible marriages to, to how many marriages Two. Two. But don't you understand, when you have a childhood where a mother kicks, kicks you verbally every day, you don't think you're worth anything. So you pick bad, you have Two's bad badly. taste in men. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got this wonderful card today. Oh, Joe, I wish you could see me. <laughs> it says on the, on the sixth day, God created man. Oh, that God, what a kidder. <laughs> <laughs> what a kidder. It's just, I mean, I'm going to keep this card forever. The person that sent it to me also sent me years ago a dish towel. A dish towel. You call them tea we towels, do. Yeah, don't yeah. you? A 
at this show. And it says, queen of everything. <laughs> That's so you. <laughs> and I've, I've kept that too. I suppose, obviously, it, it's a, it is that vicious cycle that's, that most people are aware of now, that if you have been abused, not just physically or, or not even physically, just psychologically. Uh, I would have reported my mother, and they would have taken me away from her when I was 13 or 14. She, she was really accelerating. She was getting good at it by right, that time. Right. And it was when she needed someone, because I was the only one that reacted. She could make me cry. My sister didn't give a shit. W w was your dad just not on the scene or? My dad loved my mother so much. And my daddy said to me, my father was very much at fault, but you got to know my mother. You don't battle my mother. You do not confront my mother. And my father, and my father adored her. And my father said to me, you're living in her house, her house, not our house, her house, you follow her rules. Right. And when I came back from an automobile accident, she wanted to charge me rent and I had no money, oh my none. And my father then stepped in and said, no, you don't. But when I came back the second time, I came back one after the first divorce, she wanted to charge me rent. I'd lost my job. I had no money. He, he said, no, you don't. But after the second one, when I came back from an automobile accident where I almost died, she didn't tell him. Uh, and I paid her rent for a year and a, a year, I think it was. And I thought she was saving it to, to help me pay for my flat. No, she never did. Do you see marriage as an escape then? So when you suddenly met somebody, uh, or, or was it an arranged marriage? Was it somebody that you knew? It's hard. I knew, I knew Tommy. Uh, it was a, it was a, a thing um, ever since I can remember. I wanted to be married and have children. Lots of children. I, I worked in, in, I think you know, from the time I was 14. Yeah, 14. I worked uh, with um, a daycare center after school for Holocaust survivors' children. And every summer I worked in the Jewish community center's day camp with little children. And uh, I love children and I, uh, I like men. Uh, I wanted to uh, be married. And, uh, but I was so messed up psychologically. Uh, my friend Andrea says to me, because I have had and I've always said this, I don't know whether you saw I Love Men or I talk about it. I have, I've never had a man come on to me and my, never, never, except for the two men. And my friend, uh, Andrea says that's because A, you don't recognize it and B, you don't send out the right signals. And I just started getting an email from a man who literally saved my life. I'm alive today because of him. And when I tell you his name, you will laugh because in this country, it would be, it's, it's a crazy name. His name is Dickie Klein. Dickie Klein. He is not Richard. <laughs> yeah, Richard. He, he is not Dickie. Uh, he is a, a basketball, a basketball star wow. at the University of Michigan. Uh, he is now, oh, he's 88. He's 88. And I still call him Dickie. He says, nobody's called me that for 50 years. He's Dickie to me. Um, he called me every day and I just started getting emails from him and uh, in my book, Starving Hearts, which is the story of my first marriage, I talk about an affair I had with a man named Bobby Golton who has left us. He's, he's gone. Uh, I did not consummate the affair. It made for better reading when I said that I did, right. but I did not. And Dickie was telling me they were both um, fraternity brothers. And Dickie was telling me how Bobby would come home after we went out and he would he would be crying because he would say, there's just no way I can I can solve her problems. She's so uptight and so insecure. There's no way I can get through to her, which he could have if he would have kept trying because I loved him. Uh. But um, he was my first love. But I was too uh, psychologically damaged to really love. And you have to understand that. I don't believe I was capable of loving anyone until I was in my 70s. It's probably you need to love yourself to love other people. And if mm -hmm. you've been brought right. up in a, a psychologically damaging 
home as a small child where you've been told those things, you're not going to be in love with yourself at all, are you? Completely the opposite. So no. it's impossible to, uh, to allow there anyone was else. no way. I, I really believe, but of course, since I was 70, uh, one of the things that I talk about is uh, being hot has a sell by date. <laughs> it certainly does. <laughs> and I am I am about 30 years past my <laughs> sell by date. So what happens is what's happening now. Uh, people love me. They absolutely adore me, but I'm not an item. No. But I actually I and, and I never will be. I mean men, I lots of men kiss and hug me. I love it. But there's uh, I mean you know it's there's nothing It's there. it's a weird thing because I just I just agreed with you on a point that actually I'm going to take back because I don't agree that, you, that there isn't a sell by date. The media would have us believe that there is a sell by date for love and for being attractive and um you know that's partly why I want to do these podcasts is to sort of um, you know, have a have a go back at, at mass media and say, you know, look, Lynn Ruth, you are a force of nature. <laughs> You're an amazing, oh God, love but you. you are, you absolutely are. Um, and and you know, I don't think of it. I think of someone who's finally found her. her yeah, but that it, I'm happy. Yes, and that is incredible because so many, you know, yourself. You're saying that the people that live in your your block there oh. are they're not happy and they're they're not living no. their life. They're here, but they might as well not be. Um, and so, what is the point in us being like that? There isn't. There, it's far better to have the mindset that you've had, and you know, everyone else that I'm speaking to are. They're incredible people. They're ordinary people like us, totally ordinary people. There's nothing significant or special about any of us. And yet. Absolutely, Joe. That's what I, I maintain that. I have no special talent. I've developed some special talents, but anybody. Exactly. Can. And also you, you've taken life by the, by its throat and given it a massive shake and, and, and found your place in it. Like you said, you know, you do love yourself now. It's taken an, an, yes. an enormous journey to get there, an enormous amount of time. It's that old adage, isn't it? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think... Yes. Yeah, I think that that's the most important thing. What doesn't kill you make, it makes you stronger. I was talking to someone not too long ago, and I was saying, you know, I've talked to so many people that had the courage when they were 16 to walk out and leave, which is what I should have done. But then, and he said to me, no, he said, you couldn't. There was, I had no, no place to go. No. Uh, I had no money. No. What was I supposed to do? Just walk out and live in the So street? what happened to that? How long were you in the first marriage for that, that was unsuccessful? Two years. Two years. Two years. So that's quite short, really, then. I would have stayed and I would have died because my anorexia was getting worse and worse and worse. I would have died. And then... Um, so again, that's a case in point as well, because at the time, obviously, you would have thought that was the end of the world. But, but the statement you've just made proves to, to anybody that's going through similar things that, you know, if he hadn't have done, it would have been the end of you because it was not right. You know, you were not well and, and you were not right together. What you do, what you do is a very British saying, you get on with it. I was teaching. I mean, someone said to me, I think it was Rob Mayhew. He said, well... Were you were were you happy uh, during this time uh, that uh, from the time I graduated from Stanford until uh, I started? I said I didn't have the luxury of worrying about happiness. I had no money. I worried about getting enough food on the table to eat. Yeah. I worried about paying my rent and paying in America. I had taxes. Believe it or not, they didn't give a shit that I couldn't eat. I worried about things like that. I worried. I didn't have time to worry about whether I was happy. That was a luxury that is good for the middle class. <laughs> I was lower class. Yeah, that's interesting. And so how did... Yeah, and you've got to remember that. How did you um, then meet your second husband? And, and what was it? How big a gap between uh, leaving, splitting? There was, a, there was a woman named Carol Van Balen who had a cousin who was older and unmarried from Columbia City, Indiana, and she introduced me to him, and he was gay. And this is 1959. I didn't know he was gay, but you have to understand what happened to people in 1959 if they were gay. They they went into the hospital. They were they were uh, they went to prison, and he needed a cover, and he did a very good job. He did a very good job of convincing me. I, by that time, I had given up on love. 
it was a secure relationship. So was there a m- mutual uh, respect for each other at least, and you did have a have mm-hmm. a love even if it wasn't a physical relationship? No, it, well, it, it wasn't physical before because I was a good. In those days, you didn't sleep with someone. Remember, we didn't have the pill, and we didn't have. Uh, we all we had was the rhythm method, <laughs> and I always said the only rhythm method I knew was on the dance floor. You uh, and men did not use condoms. It was not a thing. They didn't use condoms. So you got pregnant. So you didn't have sex until you were married. Right. Because in, and, uh, in those days, the morals were very, very rigid. You got pregnant and you weren't married. You went to visit an aunt. Yeah. Had the baby and gave it yeah. away. I didn't know he was gay. It didn't even occur to me. When we got married, we did not consummate the marriage. Uh, and I thought it was because he couldn't stand me. Listen, nobody could. The other husband couldn't. My mother couldn't. You can see how you would think uh, that. I thought, well, it's just another one. Yeah, never occurred to me he was gay. He told my father. Did he? Uh, well, because he called my father and said, come get her. I can't stand her. <laughs> he didn't say and that. And my father drove I drove to Indiana. He drove up to Indiana and, and, and came in and got me. That's in my cabaret. And I that is not in my... The book that talks about the anorexia is called uh, Starving Hearts. And this one tells you about my my voyage into comedy, which is getting the last laugh. But yeah, uh, the point is that if people realize they have choice, we, it's so easy for us to blame our parents, to blame, uh, uh, blame uh, our city, to blame uh, our lack of uh, opportunity, uh, to blame uh, our partner. The only person that can make you happy is you. When I look back on my childhood, I was imprisoned. And I, the truth is that I would call her with every accomplishment I did. It was never enough. To tell her. And she never was never good enough. But there was always something wrong with it. Yeah. But I wanted her to know I was great. And uh, uh, I need to tell you, she never figured that one out. <laughs> but <laughs> we all know, <laughs> and you do now. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> I became anorexic to punish her. It was my way of getting back at her. She was a magnificent cook. Oh, I see. She had a food problem. Marsha had a food problem. She was obese. Um, I had a food problem. I used that food to get to, to control right. her. I could make her have a... It's in Starving Hearts. Yeah. And there's a sentence in there that said, when I ate, she smiled at me. When I ate, she let me go to a party. When I ate, she let me get a new dress. So I ate and I ate and I ate every bit. And that's the bulimia. And then you would, obviously bulimia is that you'd go off and be sick. Yeah. I took laxatives, which was awful. Wow. But uh, yeah, I had no idea this was a disease. But it, uh, it's always so, uh, it's, I mean, I've known you quite a few years now. And I think we, we both met in Edinburgh. Well, I definitely saw you first in Edinburgh. I know that. I saw you coming up the hill when you'd bust your arm. <laughs> and she was, Lynn Ruth was still <laughs> oh, yeah. doing her one woman show with a broken arm and flyering her show. And Yeah, and I not only did my show, but I did open mics. Yeah. I did all of you did, You're amazing. So how many Edinburgh shows have you put on now so it's 11 or 12 because that's the other thing that you do which not all comedians do um you you are a, a huge smash on the cabaret circuit as much as uh just mm-hmm, straight mm-hmm. stand-up as well and you're and burlesque yes, and burlesque which i love <laughs> so there's not many 80 something year olds that um uh ripping off her clothes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and is there have you got a, a website Lynn Ruth, where you can see things like that yeah, lynnruthmiller.com. So uh, if you want to check out her, is, is your burlesque on there? I'm assuming it is. There's a little bit. Yes. Uh, I just want all of it to start again. Yeah. The lockdown for me, because my future is not as big. I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing this. I'm intending to keep doing it till I die. But the point is, there comes a time... And I hope, Joe, I'm smart enough to know when that time comes before you see it, when your performance isn't that sharp, but you still do yeah. it. Ken Dodd had that problem. I'm hoping that I catch it before I just 
drone on and on. I, as long, right now, I'm okay. And I have a new show I want to write. I have a new cabaret show I want to write and a new book I want to write. So I'm, I've got a lot to do before I disintegrate. Well, you're holding it together incredibly well. And it's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you and see you. I hope I gave you what you wanted. I've got to get to the post. Yes. I'm going to have to get to yeah, lunch. Go. But send me some dates. I will. Thanks uh, for listening to Real Folk with me, Joe Burke. 